when I was at other organizations, fighting to be in the room as a Black woman, really, it made me question if I was doing the right thing. It made me question the organization's um, want for inclusivity and belonging. Welcome to the All Inclusive podcast, where each week I chat with industry experts and diversity, equity, inclusion executives from the world's leading global brands who share their knowledge, experience, and actual takeaways to help inclusive employers create cultures of belonging where everyone can thrive. Today, I've got the great pleasure of being joined by Shayla Gage. She is the Senior Vice President of Talent, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging at Reformation. And she has more recently been named as one of the top 100 DEIB leaders of 2022. I'm so thrilled to have this conversation with her. Welcome, Shayla. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. I, um, I'm excited to be here. So why not kick off and tell our listeners a little bit more about you and your journey to where you are today at Reformation? Yes, well, I am um, excited to be at REF. And for those who are new to fashion, because I'm relatively new to fashion as well, Reformation is a sustainable fashion company. And we focus on bringing sustainable fashion to everyone, um, all sizes, all, in- we're a very inclusive culture. My background is mainly within talent acquisition. And I've been with diversity, equity, and inclusion. You know, being in TA, there's always an aspect of DE&I and whatever I do. Um, My my background, uh, I've owned my own diversity executive search firm. Um, That was years ago. And I've worked for organizations like JDS Uniphase, which is in high tech, a supplier of Google. I've worked for Nissan North America where I've led global teams from across Japan, um, Brazil, Singapore, Poland. I've worked for Pratt Whitney, where I've led global teams in Canada, Poland, the US. And now I'm responsible for diversity, equity, inclusion, and talent for reformation. So my background goes all the way from engineering, automotive, aerospace and now fashion wow oh my goodness that is that is a trip that's a journey (laughs) so it is it's so interesting for hearing from someone who's gone from kind of an engineering aerospace automotive background jumping to fashion and retail for you like why why did you change industries oh yes that's a fantastic question you know i was at an I was at a point in my career where I had seen, I had created strategies for large organizations that were either taking talent acquisition from in-house and are taking it from an external facing and now bringing it in-house or creating new DEI strategies for large companies where resources were somewhat unlimited. And I, I had the fantastic opportunity with Reformation to almost build from scratch. Reformation has been on a DEI and a DEI journey before I got here, but this was really my opportunity to put to really leave a legacy to to put my name on something that I can build from the ground up. And I wanted because I've seen what success looks like on a grander scale. And reformation with our our goal of bringing sustainable fashion to everyone, our focus is people and planet. We are, one of our goals is to be climate positive by 2025. An organization that is thinking climate positive by 2025, that is focused on planet first, that's a long-term game. And I thought with everything that I know about TA and DE&I, When organizations struggle, when there's times of uncertainty, which we are definitely in a period of uncertainty right now with macroeconomics, one of the first things to go is talent acquisition or DE&I. 
And I looked at reformation as if they're in the long-term game, then I know they're going to have my back. And that's exactly what has happened. So I've been able to come in and continue the journey that they've been on. And I have full support of the organization. There's, I'm being pulled into conversations. I am, I am, there's a yearning of the organization as to, yes, we are, we are diverse because we're a female based organization. So we over index on female by gender, but when it comes to inclusivity and belonging, the organization is like, give me more. Yeah. So I left the aerospace industry, a very data driven, which was fun in its own way. Cause you talk to engineers and you build a business case for diversity through numbers. And they're like, ah, I got it. And so that was fun in its own way, but to build something on my own was truly a dream. Oh, fantastic. And so, I mean, one of the things that, that from leaders that I've spoken to is a challenge is that they're, they're fighting to get themselves into the room or into all the variety and all the different functions of, of a business and being in the room and listening in for you. It sounds like at reformation that wasn't, that's not necessarily the case, but because it's so successful, I'd love to hear from you what what difference do you feel it's made the fact that you're not having to kind of push to be in the room Oh wow that is a fantastic question you know and I'll get vulnerable when I was at other organizations fighting to be in the room as a black woman really it made me question if I was doing the right thing. It made me question the organization's um, want for inclusivity and belonging. It, it made me wonder if the org was ever going to get there. So just fighting for a seat at the table had came with all of these questions behind it. But having a seat at the table, having not even, and that, <laughs> I pause because I think of one of Shirley Chisholm's quotes where she said, if there's not a seat at the table, it's up to me to pull the seat up to the table myself. It's up to me to bring that chair. And so in other organizations, I was bringing the chair to the table and now I am coming in and it, what it does is it builds this insane amount of trust and the, the things that we tackle, the questions that we ask are so authentically focused on outcomes and solutions versus the politics. And I see what that does for an organization is it really at Reformation, we are focused on, like we are a business to consumer. And we know, I, I feel like I work with some of the smartest individuals in fashion because they know their customer well. And every every tackle, every question that we have in the de and I space, it's not only does this impact the employee, is this, it's how does it impact our external market? How does it impact the LGBTQ plus individual coming into our store, do they feel like they belong? How does it impact the black woman who has curves? Um, can she fit our clothes? And it allows for just knowing that my expertise and what I am bringing to the table is wanted it allows for me to fully give all of myself and knowing that doing so affects our employees and the external market. Oh, great. Fantastic. I want to work for Reformation. You've sold it to me. Oh my goodness. <laughs> well, you definitely got a new customer anyway. Like the, the clothes are amazing. So, but I think, um, what, you touched on is is a good point in terms of not only you looking at it from an employee standpoint but also for a customer that like that you're serving in the market um and i think fashion and retail in some aspects 
over time or in throughout history, if you look back, particularly for the underrepresented groups and for women of color, um, it's just not really been a playing field for us. Like we've just not really seen ourselves depicted in it. Um, and we've always been in the background. And so I feel like in most recent years, there has been a change, but there's still a lot of more work to be done. And I'm so glad, it's so nice to hear from someone like yourself that's working in an organization which values not only your opinion, but really wants to to kind of bring it to fruition. Like they want to actually implement your ideas and make sure that you are reflected in the work and in the products that they, they produce. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm so excited. I'm so pleased. I mean, so you clearly, you've been successful. You're doing all the right things. You've been named top 100 DEIB leader. So I'm interested to hear from you, in your opinion, what does a diverse, equitable and inclusive workplace look like? I am, I'm reading a book um, by Lily Zhang, They, Them. And, and it's made me ponder myself what what really is DEIB usually I, I would answer that a diverse organization is one in which there's demographically diverse but what I've come to believe just recently is an organization that is diverse and inclusive is one in which underrepresented groups trust that the organization has their best interests in mind and acts to do so. And I think the big difference that Lily Zhang has brought in her forth in her definition, which is somewhat related to that, is the trust and the action. Because there are some organizations over the last few years that have put diverse leaders in the forefront, but those diverse leaders may not have the trust of the, of, of the underrepresented groups that they are to be representing. And, and it could look like someone who is LGBTQ+, plus, but says they are not officially out in the organization or someone who is a person of color that believes that other people of color can pull their pull themselves up by their bootstraps. I believe a an organization that values diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging really aims to seek trust from their employees, trust from their constituents or the external market. And then every action that it happens throughout the employee experience, throughout the candidate experience, throughout the customer experience is act with that in mind. I totally agree. What would you say is an effective way to build that trust? It's through listening. It's through listening and we're going to take a minute to thank our friends at Dandy, the DEI analytics company for supporting the show. To drive real change today, DEI leaders need to be strategic and they need to be data driven. That's why today's most successful DEI leaders use Dandy to measure and manage their DEI programs in real time, track key DEI metrics and create reports at a push of a button. Are you ready to join the DEI measurement movement? Click the link in the description below to download your free essential guide to data-driven DEI transformation. One of my, I was in a conversation with my CHRO and he asked me, cause he's an ideation type of guy. And he was like, Shayla, what's one of the things that you think would really move our organization from, if you had one thing to, to do, what would it be? And it would be to build leaders that lead inclusively and with empathy. And that means a lot. If I am a leader that leads with empathy, that means I am putting myself in the seat of my employee during a hard time. If I'm an empl employer that leads with empathy, that means that I am 
building talent development programs that meet each individual where they are, understanding that each person has a different need. If I am an employer that leads with inclusivity, then I am thinking about safe places for my employees. I am thinking about affinity networks or employee resource groups. I think that trust is truly listening in to the organization and understanding where you are as a company and building off of that. I've seen so many organizations in the last few years that have brought on chief diversity officers or who have brought on um, directors in DEI and have just taken someone else's blueprint or plan for DEI and said, okay, we're going to do that. This is what Coca Cola did. We're going to do that. This is what Amazon did. We're going to do that. And I don't think that is success. Success is really, it's creating, it's doing listening sessions, having focus groups, listening into what, looking at your engagement scores, listening into what the employees are saying, and then building plans that specifically tailor to your organization. For example, when I was at Pratt, I wanted to do a um, DE, we built a DEI um, certification. And that certification had, it had mentors. It was five levels of different classes that individuals had to go through. And when I came over a rep, I thought, okay, we're, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to build the DE&I survey and yeah. uh, certification. And I realized that what we needed first was a certification on hiring. I needed to train our managers on how to mitigate bias in the, in the hiring process. I needed to train our managers on microaggressions and I needed to get to the retail stores and train our store managers what microaggressions look like so that they could see it from their customers so that they can mitigate it in, inside of our retail stores. Yeah. And and then within a few years from from now, we may get to that DE&I certification, but I wasn't able to just pick up one plan and land it in another mm. business. And for you, what was the way for you to identify those gaps? Like when you went in, how did you know that actually we need to go back and do microaggression training? We need to look at what the managers are, are, are doing and, and kind of eliminating bias for, for hiring. How did you, how do you know this? <laughs> you know, um, Raf had been on some work. So work had already been done before I got here. And there was a DEI, there is a DEI executive committee and a DEI council. And that DEI committee and council had really focused on trying to create inclusivity. And they had the committee, I utilized the committee to help me understand what were the pain points. And then I utilize I utilized the executives to help me understand where their um how I can hold them accountable. And so it was really, it was really paying attention to what had been done before and then listening to the employees to see what, what was still a pain point. And, and then some of it is basic DE&I 101. I wanted to have a common language of where we were going together. And so although some work had been done um, I didn't, I had the opportunity to chayla it. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and now we, we have the same language as what a microaggression is or, or what a, um, what unconscious bias is. And we're moving together as an organization with that, with that language in mind. Did you face any challenges so uh, have you faced any challenges so far along the way? What's, could you just give us a little bit of insight into yeah. that and how you've overcome it? You know, I think the biggest challenge that I have, and I'll be vulnerable here again, is as a Black woman in de and I, I walk into a room and sometimes people think I am speaking on 
behalf of all Black women and that my experience is only, or what I am speaking of is only that of a Black woman. I, I think the biggest challenge that I had was making sure that I am represented, re representative of every underserved, every minority, every individual that needs a voice, be that veteran, LGBTQ+, be that um, Hispanic, Asian, Black, um, disabled. I needed to make sure that the organization heard, hears the voice of everyone. And, and I, I, I also think one of the challenges that I had was understanding retail because you, you mentioned it earlier, like there's been a lot of change in fashion in the few, in the last few years. But one of the things I realized is that fashion was meant to be exclusive, meaning like there's, if you're a luxury brand, there's Michael Kors, there's Zara, there's Fashion Nova, there's, which are fast fashion, not really luxury, but there's, there's um, Coach, there's all of these, East St. LeBron, you know, there's all of these brands and what they want is for you to feel like you're a part of their community. So in order to be a part of their community, there's exclusivity automatically built in. And when exclusivity is there, then there's bias, right? So I am working for an organization that's saying we want to be inclusive without being exclusive. We want to be sustainable and we want to be we want to be an organization in which everyone sees themselves in our clothes, which is not typical fashion. Mm, yeah. So I had to I had to learn that retail is a much different beast. The nuances of it are extremely different and if someone is coming into our organization thinking that it's typical fashion, then, you know, they've got another thing coming because it's different. Yeah. <laughs> but I like <laughs> that though. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love the Chanel's, Yves Saint Laurent's out there. But at the same time, I completely relate to just being able to just go down the road and I've got an event coming up and I just want to get something that's within my price range yes. realistically that I can see myself look good in and I'm saving the yes. world at the same time like I mean it ticks all the boxes yes. do you know what I mean like yes. I don't want to have to break the bank to be able to buy the dress but I still want to look like I broke the bank yeah that's one of the things I, I love about um the people that I work with they know our customers so well and one of the things our people who love our brand say is that they know when they put on a rough dress, like, I feel good. I feel sexy. I feel like I can conquer the world. Everyone should have that feeling. And yeah. to know that you're doing it with a sustainable brand and to know that the brand is focused on, like, the big issues of the world, focused on not only do we build sustainable clothes, but we lobby. Like, we are a part of political the political landscape when it comes to people and planet and knowing that an organization has that value in mind, then where else could you go? What else? My CEO, when I talk about DEI training or when I talk about um, DEI data, she's, she's always like, so what else? Like, <laughs> what else can you do? What How else? can we push that even there? further? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> wow, that is a challenge in itself. <laughs> yes, but it it's really good. is. No, that's it's great. It's a good one. Yeah, no, it's, yeah. A, it's a good one to have, definitely. And you touched on data. I'm going to, like, pivot away from, from my next question a little bit because I'm interested to know. It's one of the, I want to say it's the analytics of DEI is something that, hasn't really been talked about very much but it is an integral mm -hmm. part of of being successful in the space I think um because it is. you need to know your numbers you need to to know where you are at and where you want to be and whether you're even anywhere near where you want to be 
Um, yes. And so for you, what what would you, what's your opinion on the data? Like, is there something in particular that you found really works or hasn't worked well? You know, when I was at my previous organization, I was able to put data in front of engineers and in a certain way, they would it would easily build the business case for DE&I. They would easily see if I said, you know, and this isn't the number, but if I said 46% of your organization is non-diverse, then that means 66% is majority, right? Like you're able to put the data and that math might, might not have added up. But anyway, <laughs> you, <laughs> we get, you it. get what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> you get what I'm saying. Yeah. On w- when I look at the data on the, my current organization, we are heavily female indexed. And so what I am looking at is our engagement scores. How do the employees feel about, um, our feedback, our talent management processes. How do employees feel about their managers or leaders? Um, Do they feel that we are an inclusive environment? Do they have a sense of belonging? And so I, what this allowed me is to, I have to go a little bit deeper into the data to really pull some things out. Additionally, when I look at DE&I data, not only do I look at demographics as of how many um, Black, Asian, Hispanic um, individuals we have at the company, but what is our retention rate of those of those affinity groups? What is our performance rating of those af- affinity groups compared to the majority? What is the um, promotion rate of that group compared to the majority? And the overall organization, when I look at, because we are an organization of close, a little, probably a little over 800 inclusive of all of our retail stores. What are the higher, what's the hiring volume? And are we over indexed? One of the things that I'll be looking at in 2023 is looking at the external market of how much talent is available and comparing our internal mark, our internal employee base to say, do our insides look like our outside? Are we representing the communities where we live and work? And I think a lot of companies have an opportunity to do that. What I love about REF and what I, and I'm smiling now because I'm thinking about, thinking about the people that I work with, we are we are invested not only in our employees today, but we're looking at pipeline of talent for tomorrow. We're, we're investing in high school seniors. We're mentoring high school seniors, not college because, and that's a big difference. That's understanding that mentoring a high school senior that's going into college, you may not benefit from that individual four or five years from now. But that's where we're at. That's where we are, and we're we're investing in like-minded um, companies or or like-minded organizations that are also invested in ty- in pipeline of the future. What do you think DEI leaders aren't talking enough about, and they really need to be? I really think that some of us are doing initiatives we're doing activities and are we really doing things that lead to sustainable outcomes um are we creating safe places for our employees do we have organizations that are built on psychological safety i think that we are over indexed on demographic on on diversity on how many people we're over indexed on making sure that out of three individuals interviewing for a job one of them is diverse we're over indexed on all of the things that talent acquisition can do but we're not paying attention to our employees inside of our space 
And do our employees trust us? Do our employees trust that we have their best interests and their backs? Because Mm -hmm. when you, one of the things that I, I don't know how it happened with Raf, but my, one of my first days in, we had an offsite and during that offsite, there was this opportunity to talk about psychological safety and trust. And when you have that trust from your leaders or trust from the people that you work with, then you are comfortable taking risks. And if you're comfortable taking risks, then innovation thrives. Mm-hmm. And that's where I think DEI leaders could do more work is on our internal, making sure that our employees trust us and making sure that every outcome and action that we do is with that trust in mind, because then our employees can really be their whole best selves. And then they can bring forth to the organization ideas and things and items for our customers that will really move the needle. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I think, I mean, the business case has already been met, like it's already been made to say that yeah. more diverse, inclusive export organization creates is just more successful and they're more innovative yeah. and the pathway to that is as you said which I hadn't really thought of it before but it is it is inevitably it is to build trust with with the people that you're that are in your workspace as they currently are now and for anyone that comes in yeah. to know that they are they've got a safe space and yeah the psychological safety is there like yeah I think yeah. I, I totally agree it's definitely a piece which isn't being talked about enough um and and that's that's something that's new that's come out from the leaders that I spoke to it's not something that that they've mentioned um (laughs) so that that's really interesting thanks so much Shayla for that and thanks so much for everything that you've shared today um, and for for being vulnerable as well I really appreciate it Uh, just before you leave us um could you give our listeners out there some parting piece of advice I think um I would I would challenge my DEIB practitioners to always learn. Like we don't have the answers. One of the I I am sometimes nervous that the insane popularity that DEI has right now that it's going to wane, and I don't want to be on. I don't want to see um, a a a heading on an article that says how to get rid of your DEI office like like that's not that that doesn't that that's not where I want us to land and in order to prevent that we have to meet organizations where they are we we can't always come in with um one plan and think that that plan is going to make it we have to listen to the organization, to the employees, to those who are lending their voices. We have to learn, always learn. There's so We have to support each other and learn from each other because that's the only way that this DE&I wave is going to continue. Yeah. Oh my gosh, totally true. And and that's the reason why I do this podcast is to be able to, to give leaders like yourself it. the platform to learn to share um, and to provide support. Um, so yeah, I totally agree. Could, couldn't agree more. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm grateful that this space exists. And I've learned so much from listening to some of your leaders and some of the leaders that you've had on here. And I've connected with some of them after. Like, I can't believe you said yes, because we all need, this work is freaking hard yes. work. And if you are a minority in the seat, like you, ha- not only do you have imposter syndrome coming up, but you have the weight of every underrepresented group on your back wanting more and knowing what that feels like. Like there's trauma that comes with being in this seat. So mm. thank you for having the space for us to exist. Oh, no. And and thank you for, for existing. <laughs> Honestly, the work that you guys <laughs> do is amazing and it's definitely moving the, the needle for sure. Um, so talking about connecting, how can people connect with you? 
Shayla? I am on LinkedIn as Shayla Gage. Um, and then on Instagram and I used to say Twitter. I don't know if I'm on Twitter anymore. <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't it's know so if anyone's on Twitter anymore. I don't anymore. know. I know. I mean, that, that, I was never really good with Twitter anyway. So with everything that's happening, I'm kind of just like, um, okay, maybe we might just like take a little back seat. We'll see what happens with that. <laughs> so, yeah. What happens? But if you're still there, I'm at tweet at Che. Um, tweet at Che. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter. Oh, fantastic. Well, I'll be linking down um, your social links below the episode. So whoever's listening, if you want to get in touch with Shayla and learn more about what she's doing at Reformation, have a look at um, her socials as well as on LinkedIn, because she does post really, really great content on there. Um, Once again, Shayla, thank you so much for, for joining me today. For our listeners, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe so you don't miss this conversation or any other conversations that we have here on the podcast. And um, once again, thanks again, Shayla. Thank you, Natasha.